Hi, and welcome to Rocket Science, Rocket Science 1, the first lesson in the Hanover High School March Intensive course on Rocket Science. I'm looking at the uh, Lesson 1 document, which is a Google Doc. You can find a link to this in the comments below the video. Big question to ask in Rocket Science 1. Given that there's some reason why we need to put people or things into space, what are the conditions that are necessary to keep something permanently in space. And as you may be aware, there are objects orbiting around the Earth all the time, spacecraft, satellites, the International Space Station, people. How do they stay there? What's going on? How fast do they have to go? We're going to investigate that in Rocket Science 1. First of all, some of the physics. In order to stay in space permanently, without having to use up any fuel, you need to be in a place where there's no influence from the atmosphere. So the first thing we have to figure out is what's the safe distance above the Earth for traveling in space. Now figuring that out with physics alone is pretty tough. So we're going to rely on some Google searching. So your first task is to figure out by doing some research what the minimum safe altitude is for space flight. One way you could do this is to Google, mm, what's the altitude of the International Space Station? And the answers you get might be in some units that we won't find very useful. For example, you might get an answer in miles. Well, we need kilometers. Actually, more importantly, we need to go to meters. All of the measurements we do in rocket science are going to be in terms of meters uh, for distance, kilograms for mass, and newtons for force. Once you figure that out, you might also ask, What's the minimum safe altitude for spaceflight above the moon's surface? And does the moon even have an atmosphere to get in the way? Well, if you look at some old archival video of Apollo astronauts frolicking on the surface of the moon, you'll notice they're not dressed for a day at the beach. There is no air on the surface of the moon. So can you have spaceflight at any altitude above the moon's surface? Is there anything sort of sticking up that might get in the way? So that's something to look at. You could also figure out through research how high above the moon's surface the Apollo astronauts flew before they landed. Now I'm going to scroll down in my document a little bit. As I said before, we're talking about orbits. And just a few words about what an orbit is. So as you may know, spacecraft typically travel in a circular path around the Earth. Or when they're traveling to the moon, they might be orbiting and circular path around the moon. How does that work? In general, in physics, if you want to make an object travel in a circular path, you have to keep turning the object towards the center of the circle all the time. So if you're driving in your car in a roundabout, traveling always counterclockwise, you have to keep the car turned to the left. That means you have to apply some kind of a force to the car towards the center of the circle at all times to keep it moving in that path. Sir Isaac Newton decided a long time ago that objects once set in motion like to travel in a straight line. So making something move in a circle requires always applying a force towards the center of the circle. That force is called centripetal force. In addition, Sir Isaac Newton figured out that there was some force that attracted all massive objects. For example, you standing on the surface of the Earth are attracted to the Earth through gravity, and the Earth is attracted to you. So orbits in space happen when the force of gravity acting between the spacecraft and the planet is equal to the force needed to keep that object moving in a circular path around the planet. That's the condition for a circular orbit. In general, in rocket science, in this course, you'll find that there are several sections for every topic, depending on how comfortable you are with the advanced mathematics. In this section, the advanced section, we're going to be looking at mathematically how you compare the centripetal force equation to the gravitational force equation. If, as you look at this, you think maybe you're not quite ready for that, 
go skip down to the intermediate section, and I'll get there in a moment. So, centripetal force. There's an equation for calculating how much force you need to keep an object moving in a circle. Fc, centripetal force, equals the mass of the object that's moving, times the square of its velocity, measured in meters per second, divided by the radius, that is, the distance from that object to the center of that circle of rotation. The distance r is measured in meters, the force is measured in newtons. Gravitational force, the force acting between any two massive objects, is equal to uppercase g, known as the universal gravitation constant, 6.674 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meter squared per kilogram squared, times the product of the two masses, and that's typically shown with a big M for the mass of the Earth, or the body you're orbiting around, and a little m for the mass of the object orbiting. So little m would be the mass of our spacecraft in kilograms, and big M would be the mass of, for example, the Earth, also in kilograms. That's divided by the square of the radius. Now the radius is measured, a distance measured from the spacecraft to the center of the body. In this case, the center of the Earth or the moon. Now, to figure out how fast something needs to move to travel in a circular orbit that's stable, set the centripetal force equation equal to the gravitational force equation and solve for the velocity. Moving now to the intermediate section, assuming you've done the algebra in the previous section, you would find that there is an equation that sets, uh, that determines the velocity for a circular orbit, v equal to the square root of big G, the uh, universal gravitation constant times the mass of the planet that you're orbiting around, measured in kilograms, divided by the radius. That is, the radius is the distance from the spacecraft to the center of the Earth, or the center of the moon, or whatever you're orbiting around. What we're going to do next is figure out some of the values we need to figure uh, to actually calculate that safe uh, orbital velocity. So that's what this, this table below here is for. Uh, if you feel like you'd like to do that calculation, then uh, this is the place to kind of keep track of everything. So first of all, in the first column, we need the safe orbit altitude. And that's the thing we figured out first, like how high above the surface of the Earth or the Moon can something actually travel safely? That's above the influence of the atmosphere. Second column would be the surface radius of the body. So that would be the distance in meters from the center of the Earth or the Moon to the surface. Um, thirdly, the safe spacecraft radius is just the sum of the first two, so the total distance from the spacecraft to the center of the Earth or Moon. That's the R that gets used in this satellite equation. Fourth, uh, you need the body mass, so that's the mass of the planet or Moon that you're orbiting around, again measured in kilograms, and it's a big, big number. Finally, use the satellite equation to calculate the uh, safe circular orbital velocity using the square root of gm over r. Now, for everyone, whether you've done this calculation or not, you can do the simulation to either confirm the numbers that you came up with, or if you didn't come up with any numbers, you can sort of experimentally figure out what the safe orbital velocity is. Um, we're going to be using a uh, online environment for running Python programming language called runpython.org. And we're going to use another website called github.com to store the source code that we create. So if you don't have a github.com account yet, um, I want to show you a little bit about creating an account and then finally how to create the repository for rocket science and creating files in GitHub and using them in runpython.org. If you've taken the programming course at Hanover High School, some of this may seem pretty familiar to you. So first of all, you want to create a free account with github.com. And I've got a tab open for that already. So you go to github.com, you see a page that looks like this, um, and there's a big green button that says sign up for GitHub. Now, creating an account here is not that much different from creating an account on any other website. You need to pick a username, an email address, and a password. And I think they send a confirmation email to your email address. Click OK, yada, yada, go on. Um, it's free. And the free account of GitHub means that you can store pretty much as much as you want there with a limitation that whatever you store on GitHub is publicly visible. So you don't want to store any files on GitHub 
that have secret information like your super secret password, that sort of thing. Now, I already have an account, so I'm going to click the sign in button. And once you've created your account, you probably will see a page that looks something like this. Um, I have my personal logo. Uh, you'll see a goofy little pattern that uh, GitHub creates for you as your avatar. So the first thing to do once you've created your GitHub account is to create a repository for your rocket science files. So this is going to be a collection, basically, of all your files. And to do that, you want to move to the upper right-hand corner of the GitHub page where there's a plus. Click the little arrow next to that and say New Repository. Now we get to pick a repository name. And I would recommend that you choose an obvious name like Rocket Science. So I type that name in. You can write a description if you want. The place for my rocket science, if I could spell, Python files, and select public. I think if you create a free GitHub account, that you may only have an option for creating a public repository. Lastly, this is the most important thing to do. Click the checkbox that says initialize this repository with a readme. Uh, that will mean that you can right away start creating files and working with a repository. Once you've got that, you can click the button that says Create Repository. And that should move me to, yes, there's the repository page. Tigger and Teddy, that's my username, and then Rocket Science. In here, I've got a list of the files in the repository. And by default, because I checked that box in the last page, I have a readme.md file. That's uh, MD stands for Markdown. And this is the contents of it. It's got the name of my repository and whatever description I typed in that description file uh, field. Rocket Science, the place for my Rocket Science Python files. Big deal. Now, in here, I want to create uh, a new file to use with Run Python. So I find a button up here that says Create New File and click that. Now I need a name for my file, which I put in this box. Uh, hmm rocket1.py. So the name is completely arbitrary, but there are some conventions that you should follow for Python file names. First of all, all lowercase. Second of all, no spaces. Third, every file name that's used for Python should end with a .py. The .py tells any programs or websites that use that file that this is, in fact, Python code. And that's helpful because they will format and color the code so that it looks easier to understand. And to do that, we need to know that it's Python. If we go to the bottom of this page, you want to click the green button that says Commit New File. That creates the file with that name and sends us back to the Rocket Science page where I had the README file. And now you can see a new file, rocket1.py. If I click on that, here it is, rocket1.py. There's nothing in it. So the contents should appear right here. There's nothing there. That's OK. I really want to use this over in runpython.org. So to use it, I want to go up to the top of the URL, highlight the URL, Control-C or Command-C to copy it, and then switch to runpython.org. So runpython.org, I have three main things on my screen. I've got some buttons. I've got a place to paste a GitHub URL. And I've got a code editor. First thing I want to do, if I haven't already, is log in. So log in on runpython.org means connect runpython to GitHub. So I'll click that button. Since I've done this before and I'm logged into GitHub, it automatically logs me in and connects the two together. If this is the first time that you've created a GitHub account and the first time you've used it on this computer, um, GitHub may ask you if you want to let runpython.org access your files on GitHub. The correct answer to that is, yeah, of course you do. Once you're logged in, you should see two buttons, commit and log out. Don't press log out. Um, we're going to use commit to send changes that we make on runpython.org over to GitHub so they can be stored. Well, let's try that. So remember, over on um, GitHub, I copied this URL. Well, back here on Run Python, I want to click in this upper left-hand corner window and paste with Control-V or Command-V 
that URL and then click the load button. That loads all of the contents of that file from GitHub into my run Python page. Now, what am I going to put here? I'm going to click back to that third tab, which had my uh, Rocket Science 1 lesson. <clears throat> and I see here inside these parallel lines, I've got a short piece of Python code. So I'm going to highlight that with my mouse and press Control C or Command C to copy it and switch back to run Python. Make sure my cursor is flashing in the editor window and press Control V or Command V to paste the code. Lastly, I'm going to go over to commit and commit that. Now, what did the commit do? If I click to my second tab at github.com and reload that page, I should see that my rocket1.py has this contents. And that's what I just pasted in to run Python. So basically, I've managed to connect these two websites and move data around from one to the other without too much trouble. For the most part, we're not going to pay a lot of attention to GitHub. We're going to be doing most of our work over here in runpython.org. So we have a program. Let's talk a little bit about what's in it. Uh, first of all, um, I have a line at the top of my program that says from ggrocket import rocket and planet, or rocket comma planet. ggrocket is the name of a Python file that I wrote that has some basic boilerplate um, nuts and bolts code for performing the simulations. Stuff that I don't really want you to worry about. In there, I've defined a couple of Python classes called rocket and planet. On the lines below that, we're going to create instances of these objects using those classes. So the first one is I'm setting a variable named Earth equal to an instance of a planet. And by instance, I can create that by using the planet class name followed by a couple of parentheses. That executes the constructor code and makes an object that represents a planet. Next, I create a rocket object. Rocket equals, so rocket is a name that I define, equals rocket, the name of the class I imported. And inside the parentheses, I put the name of the planet object that I just created, which was all lowercase earth. Finally, to run the simulation, I call the run method on the earth. I say earth.run. And in the parentheses, I now link it back to the rocket um, object that I created. All right. So to execute our program, I go to the button bar here and I find a button called Go. I'll click that. It's a brief pause while software is loaded. And now we have our running simulation. So what does this consist of? I have the ground. Uh, by default, again, we created a planet that represents planet Earth. So it's green. If I press the left and right arrow keys on my keyboard, I can rotate the spacecraft. So, for example, a typical spacecraft is launched going straight up. And in the upper left-hand corner, I can see some parameters about that. I see its velocity and acceleration. I have an altitude in meters, thrust in newtons, and the mass for my spacecraft, which is one kilogram. That's a very small spacecraft. When you start to simulate larger spacecraft, uh, you'll show a mass that represents not only the spacecraft, structure, but also the mass of the fuel contained. And as the fuel burns, you can see that the mass is changing. True anomaly is a funny term for like where around the planet's circumference is the spacecraft located. So zero degrees would be all the way over on the right. 90 degrees would be at the top of the planet. So we're sort of looking at the very top of the planet here. Well, it's sort of like being at the North Pole. View scale tells me how far I'm zoomed in or out of my display. And that's in units of pixels per meter. So 10 pixels per meter is the default zoom or view. Um, that means that for every 10 pixels you see on the screen, that represents one meter in real life. Uh, time zoom shows me whether or not my simulation is speeded up. Zero means it's running in real time. And finally, at the bottom, you should see the elapsed time in seconds. Now, display-wise, if I want to zoom back and see more of my planet, I can use the scroll wheel on my mouse or maybe two-finger scrolling on a laptop touchpad. And as I do that, I want to look at my view scale. To zoom out, I want my view scale to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And as I do that, you can notice that the surface of the planet begins to show some curvature. Until finally, I can zoom all the way out and see the entire planet. If I click and drag on the display, I can pan that display around and move to different places. And I can zoom back in. 
So I can pretty much go anywhere I want quickly and see what's going on. Now, another thing you'll notice as I zoom in and out is that my spacecraft, my rocket ship icon does not change its size. So it's not attempting to be a literal representation of a rocket. It's just a symbolizes the location of the rocket and the direction it's pointed. All right, next up, I want to do some actual experiments that are a little more exciting than having a spacecraft sitting on the planet. So I click the stop button and I'm going to go back to my code over here and um, I can make some simple changes. For example, when I created my rocket and put it on the Earth, um, by default, the altitude it chooses to put my rocket on is zero, which is sitting on the ground. I can alternatively give it an initial altitude by typing inside the parentheses, comma, space, altitude equals 50. Now, that's a height above, initial height above the ground for my rocket. And by default in, in GG Rocket, any distance is going to be in, in units of meters. So 50 meters is not very high. I've made a change in my code that I want to save, so I'm going to commit it. That stores a copy over on GitHub, and then I can execute. Whoa, what happened? I'll try that again. Go. Ah. Hmm. I had to do a stop and go a few times for some reason. I think when I stopped it, it wasn't completely stopped. Uh, so I stop and go. You can see initially the rocket at its starting place and then like it falls. Um, but I don't see what happens after that. If I zoom out, I can see it landed on the ground. But if I stop and run again, I'm back in my zoomed in condition. I can see the beginning of the fall, but, but not the, uh, the end. So um, the next thing I want to do is set an, an initial zoom or view scale. And I can do that by inserting um, an initial view scale into the planet creation code. So I go up to the line that says Earth equals planet. And inside the parentheses, I type view scale equals 0. Point, oops, no, view scale equals 5. I want that. That'll zoom me out just a little bit. I'll commit that change and then execute. And then I watch my rocket fall. I don't want to see it again. I can stop, go, fall. Now, one thing to notice as it's falling, whoops, there is an acceleration here. And um, while it's falling, the acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared. What does that mean? Um, Acceleration is a physics term that describes how quickly a speed is changing. So when you drop something on Earth, as it falls, it goes faster and faster. And the way in which it goes faster and faster is the same for any object that you drop on the Earth. 9.8 means that every second that this object is falling, it goes 9.8 meters per second faster than the second before. So initially, when you drop something, it starts out not moving at all, and a second later it's going to be moving at 9.8 meters per second squared. A second after that it's moving at um, twice that, 19.6 meters per second. After three seconds it's going to be moving three times 9.8 and so forth. So that acceleration is a gauge of how quickly something is going to speed up as it falls. So anyway, 50 meters is not very high. I think we want to go with something a little bit higher. So let's go back to our code. Um, now, let's say we start out at a safe altitude for space flight that you figured out earlier. So go back to that table uh, where you typed in the, or wrote in the, the safe altitude in meters. Um, I'm just going to pick one that I think is ballpark about right for altitude. 400,000 meters. So 400,000 meters means 400 kilometers or 400 kilometers. And that's um, pretty far. It's roughly, I think, where the altitude of the International Space Station is. 
Its altitude actually varies over time, but it's in the right ballpark. And I'm going to pick a view scale that I've already figured out is pretty good. It's a really small number. I'm going to commit that. And let's try running that. happens. So, oh, my course is, no, course is a little bit wonky still. I'm going to fix that. Um, looks like nothing's happening. Now, um, it is saying that my acceleration is 8.8, .8, which is interesting. That's a smaller acceleration than what I had when I was on the surface of the planet. And that's an indication that as you move farther and farther away from the Earth, the effect of gravity gets smaller. But here we are, we're 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, and the acceleration is 8.8 .8 .8 instead of 9.8. .8. So it's about 10% about lower than it was on the surface. So that's almost full gravity. So that means my spacecraft should be plummeting towards the surface of the Earth. And in fact, if I look in the upper left, I can see that my velocity is now at um, about two minutes in, is now at 1,000 meters per second. That's a kilometer per second. So that's really moving fast. Well, let me try zooming in and see if I can get to a zoom level where I can actually observe that the spacecraft is moving. Ah, there it is. So I've zoomed in to uh, about 1,000 meters per pixel. So we're at about a kilometer per pixel in my display right now. And my spacecraft is visibly moving. Velocity is 1,400 meters per second, one and a half kilometer per second. And we're about 170 seconds into the sim. That's three minutes we've been falling. So what this is telling you is if you were able to somehow magically transport yourself 400 kilometers up into the sky and then dropped, how long would it take you to hit the ground? And that's what we're seeing here. If you thought it might take like half an hour to hit the ground, well, that's way longer than it really is. It looks like we're going to hit the ground pretty soon. And this is happening in real time. Right now we're up to 203 seconds and our spacecraft is really flying, moving quite, quite qu quickly. Just kind of sit here and watch it fall. It's exciting. I mean, it's a little bit like watching paint dry, but. <laughs> I want to know if I'm 400 kilometers up in the sky, how long does it take to hit the ground? Now, if you've ever seen videos or maybe you've gone skydiving, you know, it takes a fair amount of time for a skydiver to fall from an airplane to the ground. How is it possible that from 400 kilometers in the sky, it's not taking very long to hit the ground? Well, the reason is atmosphere. First of all, our simulation here doesn't have any atmosphere, so it's as if there's no air on the planet. In reality, if you drop something from 400 kilometers, you pretty quickly hit the atmosphere, and the atmosphere would slow you down a lot. And that's what happens with skydivers. When they jump out of the airplane, they hit all this air, and they right away slow down to about 80 miles per hour, and they stay at that speed all the way to the ground. That velocity is called terminal velocity. And in this simulation, there is none. So here we are. We're about to smack into the ground at about five minutes. Bam, there we are. We just hit the ground. So that was pretty boring, you know, and not very realistic either. Like we said, you know, if there had been air there, it would have probably burned up and it would have taken longer. And anyway, that wasn't space flight. That was just falling. So space flight and what this unit is about is about orbital velocity. So to simulate that, we've got the initial conditions over here. We got the initial altitude we want. So we need initial velocity. So let me try typing in a velocity. I'm going to start with 1,000 meters per second. 
So that's one kilometers per second, which is darn fast, but is it fast enough for orbital velocity? Let's try it. I gotta commit that. Go. And we're off. Oh, oh, this I'm silly. Um, I was talking about how that, I thought there was a software glitch here. This course is not the direction the spacecraft is pointed. It's the direction the spacecraft is going in. Heading would be the direction the spacecraft is pointed. Course is the direction the spacecraft is actually moving in. That says negative 47 degrees, which is um, down and to the right, and actually mostly down at this point. So I can see as I zoom in that my spacecraft is definitely moving to the right and it's falling down. So at this rate, I think we're gonna hit the planet. So we did not have enough velocity at 1000 meters per second to um, go around. One of the issues I'm running into now is that um, it takes a long time to see the effects of any changes that I make. So we really need to speed up time a little bit. I'll sh show how to do that. I'm gonna stop this because I think it's pretty clear now that we're, we're gonna hit the planet. Um, we're not going fast enough. But before I go any further, let me add another parameter to my rocket. So I type comma, space, time zoom equals one. Now, if I do a time zoom, time zoom equals one, it means I'm gonna speed up my simulation by a factor of 10. For every second that I'm sitting here at my desk, 10 seconds will pass in the simulation. So that means that I can try things and see the effect without waiting around for a long time. So let me commit that and execute again. Oops. See, yes, it's accelerating, it's speeding up, it's gonna hit the ground. Okay, so I didn't have to wait quite as long to figure out exactly what's gonna happen here. Boom, okay. Let's go try upping our velocity a little bit. Uh, let me try 5,000 meters per second. And I'm thinking it's gonna take a little bit longer. Let me increase our time zoom to 1.5. I'll speed things up a little bit more. Let me commit that change and go. Stop, go. All right, that was not fast enough. Let's go faster. 7,000. Every time I have to do stop and go twice. I can click and drag and sort of drag my view around. So we're falling, but as we're falling, we're also moving to the right. And we're going pretty far sort of like ski jumping. You know, in a ski jump, the the landing zone is shaped so that as you fall, fall, jump <laughs> off the end of the ski jump and fall, the ground falls away below you and falls away in such a way so that when you land, you don't, you know, hit like a sack of wet cement. You actually are hitting fairly gracefully. And that's kind of what's going on here. The, Earth is curving away from us as we're falling into it. Let me try a different velocity. So let me try 9,000. 
Nine kilometers per second. Wicked fast. Get it down. Go. Go zoom in. Now, one thing I can look at here is like my altitude. And actually, now my altitude is increasing. I'm going up. So I was going so fast horizontally that I didn't fall into the ground. In fact, I'm falling away from the planet. I wonder what's going to happen. Taking a long time. You know what? I'm going to change the zoom. Time zoom. Let me change to two. I'll speed things up. So now every second that happens in my desk is going to be 100 seconds in the simulation. Now, am I going so fast that I'm going to leave the Earth forever? Doesn't look like it. Now, you'll notice my velocity here is 4,000 meters per second. So I'm going slower than what I started at. And in fact, now I'm speeding up. So I'm falling back to Earth. So I sort of fell away from the planet and slowed down and reached my maximum altitude, which is about, well, a big number. And now I'm falling back down closer and my velocity is increasing. As my acceleration, you can see I'm speeding up, speeding up. Um, my altitude is decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. I wonder if we're going to crash back into the Earth. Let's keep an eye on that altitude as I get closer. Altitude is 800, 700, 600. 500, four, it's right down to 400 kilometers again. I returned to my original starting altitude exactly after going around the Earth in this big looping path. And that's one of the cool things about orbits is even if you don't have the right velocity for a circular orbit, if you launch yourself into space around a planet, you're going to come back to where you started. And in general, when you do that, the orbits are elliptical. And you don't have to worry about getting the velocity right. Any velocity is going to give you an elliptical orbit around the planet. Now, things like the International Space Station and um, satellites that are in low Earth orbit, they don't want to do this. They want to keep their orbits pretty close to the Earth. So they use a velocity that's tailored to give them a nice circular path. And we can do a little more experimentation to figure out what that is. I could try uh, 8,000. Now let's see what that does. And one way to tell how good I'm doing is to look at my altitude. And I can see right now my altitude's going up. So I don't have a circular orbit. I am going up in altitude, but I'm a lot closer to a low orbit than I was in the last iteration. So I can make another refinement and go maybe 7,900, 7.9 kilometers per second. Again, if I look at my altitude, it's going up, but not quite as quickly as it was before. Uh, let me try. 7,800, commit, go. Oh, a little lower, 
77. Still going up. 76. Whoop. I've gone too far. Now I can see my altitude is decreasing. I am falling. So it's uh, kind of tricky to get just the right velocity. And uh, if you calculate it in advance what that velocity should be and try that here, you should see that it holds a nice steady altitude for you. So we're on the other side of the planet. That should be our low altitude point at about 150 kilometers. I think that's a little bit low. So we need to bump up our altitude, our initial velocity a little bit. So let me try 76, um, 7. I'm just sort of guessing here. And yep, we're decreasing, but not by much. Yeah, this is kind of addictive. I'm going to tweak it a little bit more. Seven, six, seven, six, seven, five. And now we're going up a little bit. This is pretty close to maintaining a constant altitude of 400 kilometers. This is pretty good. So now we should just be traveling around in a nice circular orbit. All the way around the planet. So here we are at the far side of the Earth where our altitude has increased to a whopping 409 kilometers. So the difference in altitude between the low altitude and the high altitude part is only nine kilometers. And that's pretty close to being circular. And you'll notice our velocity hasn't changed much. Um, and we should come right back to our starting altitude and velocity. Seven, six, seven, five. There it is. Nice. So we're going around in a nicely repeating elliptical orbit that's really, really close to being a circle. So in your, in your handout, if you've got one, um, you could make a note. What was your orbital altitude? What was your orbital velocity? Those are the two things that you require to keep your spacecraft in orbit around the planet pretty much forever. So things you can do from here, you can go back to the code and try the same thing on the moon. So you have the orbital radius and you have the surface radius, the planet, uh, uh, of the moon um, on that table from earlier, and you're, you've got the mass of the moon. Yeah, you should be able to do that. Um, figure out how fast um, you need to maintain orbit around the moon. Now, when you create the moon, uh, you're going to want to customize, or you might want to customize some things when you correct the radius and the mass. You could also change the color of your moon. So. Take a look at the GG rocket handout, and I'll have a link to that in the comment section below. And you can see that when you create your planet, you can also customize the color. So the moon, what color is the moon? Well, it's dark gray. Astronauts who've been there say it looks like asphalt. Now, it doesn't look like asphalt when we see it at night. It's because we see it uh, in almost complete darkness, lit by the sun. So it's wicked bright. And what we're really seeing is the sunlight. But for people walking around on the moon, it looks like asphalt, which is pretty cool. All right, so play around, have some fun.